Create a character, level them up, reach the end game. That's where the fun begins, and that is the topic of today's video. Hey there, friends, it's Kodiak here. Welcome back to Legacy Gaming. Today, we're explaining Lost Ark's expansive endgame, so you can hit the ground running on day one. First things first, this video is designed to help new NAEU players get a grasp on all the endgame content and systems in Lost Ark. Now, we don't know for certain what content is being added on day one, but we certainly can give you a snapshot of the entire endgame landscape so that you're prepared. We'll also try and do things in somewhat of a progressive order so that you can refer to this video to loosely guide you when the time is right. And with all that in mind, let's dive in. Before we get to the actual end game content, I do want to say there is a smart way to reach level 50, and that's by focusing on story quests. Each hub is going to have additional side quests, and while these are easy to complete, it's going to make it so that you reach level 50 before you actually finish the entire available main quest line. If you just do those main quest missions, you'll end up in Shushire, and once you complete that region, you'll have a set of T1 equipment, which will give you access to the first bit of vertical progression content. Once you reach level 50, the first bit of endgame content you'll most likely do are Chaos Dungeons. You'll start by porting into a small area, either solo or with a group of up to four. You'll then be assaulted by waves of minions. The goal is simple, keep killing enemies until the gauge in the top left reaches 100%. At that point, the fighting stops and you can claim your rewards. While clearing a Chaos Dungeon, you'll have to go through a portal that will bring you to a new arena with a different set of enemies. You can do two Chaos Dungeons per day and receive the max amount of rewards, but can continue doing them if you want. Additional clears will net you some exchangeable tokens. Additionally, players can engage in Guardian Raids. Think Monster Hunter, but in Lost Ark. You'll enter a small map and using a special item called a Flare, locate a Guardian, a giant monster. You can take these on solo or with a group of up to four, and your goal is to kill the monster and claim its soul before the timer runs out. These fights are incredibly fun and offer players their first real end game boss experience within Lost Ark. Unlike Chaos Dungeons, you'll have to be more cognizant of lethal one-shot mechanics, and as such, makes the entire Guardian Raid experience a nice contrast from Chaos Dungeons. You can do Guardian Raids twice a day to receive the max amount of rewards, and just like Chaos Dungeons, you can continue to run these for tokens that you can turn in for additional materials. This isn't a super efficient way to get materials, and as you'll see, there are lots of other things you could be doing for more valuable gains. If you're unable to complete the two daily Chaos Dungeons and Guardian Raids, you gain stacks in your Rest Gauge. For each task left incomplete, you gain 10 Rest. If you have 20 Rest, the next time you do a Chaos Dungeon or Guardian Raid, you'll receive double loot. In total, you can stockpile 100 Rest, resulting in five instances of double loot. If you're someone that doesn't have time to play every day, that's fine, but realize that sitting with 100 energy in your rest gauge is when you start to lose out on valuable progression. The rest system is a great way for players to catch up if they miss a day or two, but there is a point when not logging on to progress starts to really hurt you. Again, this really only matters if you're a serious progression person, but at that point, my guess is you'd be logging in to do everything every day anyways. Clearing Chaos Dungeons is the first step on your endgame journey, but the only way to get access to additional content is by upgrading your gear. In the NAEU, this process is called Gear Honing. You'll use materials acquired during Chaos Dungeons to infuse your weapons and armor, upgrading their base stats and power level. Each piece of gear can be upgraded 20 times, and this is the primary way you'll raise your item level high enough to gain entry into new endgame content. I should point out that you never want to increase your gear past plus 15, since that'll give you access to the next tier of gear, just something to keep in mind. I don't want to get too in the weeds with gear honing at this point because at T1, it's not super involved. But if you guys want me to do a full guide, drop me a line in the comments. I really want to know what videos you would find helpful as we approach launch. The pinnacle T1 progression content is Abyss Dungeons, and this is where things start to get a bit more interesting. These are more traditional dungeons with trash mobs and two challenging bosses. This is where group play really starts to matter. Taking on Abyss Dungeon solo just isn't viable, and you're going to start to see support classes like Bards and Paladins play a much more integral role in a group. Most of these dungeons are based on regions and environments you've explored during your leveling process, but the difficulty has been ratcheted up. Mobs hit harder, and bosses have plenty of new gimmicks. Abyss Dungeons can be completed one time per dungeon per week and will reward you with tier-specific items. You'll learn gold, materials, randomized accessories, which can turn out to be great, or junk. The materials you pull out of dungeons can be used to craft dungeon armor sets, which have set bonuses. 
Eventually, once T3 becomes active in the NAEU, the goal will be to focus on getting that gear, and not investing so much in the earlier sets. If you're coming from a game like World of Warcraft, you might be wondering, are there raids in Lost Ark? And the short answer is yes. Since the introduction of Tier 2 content, raiding has been a big part of the landscape of the game. In most cases, these are the most challenging aspects of the game, pitting eight players against bosses with incredible movesets requiring insane coordination. I'm going to shout out Saintone here, who is one of the best Lost Ark creators, who goes in-depth explaining what it's like to be on the cutting edge of raiding in the game. So seriously, check out his video to really see if it's something you're into. One of the most important aspects of progression PvE is getting the resources needed to hone and upgrade your gear. Enter Una's Task, daily and weekly quest that take you all around Arcasia as you do a random assortment of odd jobs. I'm not gonna lie, there's nothing really exciting or challenging about these, but it's the rewards that you're after. Just like everything else, there is a cap to how many quests you can complete, and not every task rewards you with progression materials, so you'll pick and choose which missions to take. After completing your Una's task, you're granted special tokens, which can be traded into a gold vendor for a chest of gold. These chests have a small chance of dropping gold bars, which reward you with even more gold. This is the main way to get gold early on during the endgame experience, and gold, for anybody who doesn't know, is the main currency used when interacting with other players at the auction house. One quick tip is to pay attention to what missions award the best rewards, and then use your Bifrost, an instant teleportation feature in the game that allows you to set a point in the world and return back for a little silver. You can actually unlock two additional Bifrost slots if you have the Crystalline Aura active. This is something you can have at launch if you buy or pick up a Founders Pack, we have an entire video breaking down the different Founders bundles already up on the channel, so check that out. Completing Una's tasks increases various reputations, which can also offer certain one-time rewards once you reach a certain threshold. Cube dungeons are accessible only when you have a special ticket. One ticket gives you one entry into the cube, but once inside, your goal is to stay in as long as possible, clearing as many rooms as you can and finding chests filled with loot. Since entering the cube depends on if you have a ticket or not, it's not exactly something you'll be doing every day, but when you do get the chance, you should. The goal of a cube run is to upgrade your chest from bronze to diamond. Diamond chests reward you with the best loot, which includes important items used to increase your success chance while honing. The cube does require a bit more coordination than the other endgame content we've talked about, since a single player can screw up the entire run, ending it early, forcing all players to leave prematurely. If you go in solo and die, that's it, the run's over, but if you do have a party, it's a bit more forgiving. Additionally, it's best to use integrated voice chat or something like Discord, because while the content isn't exactly hard, if one player runs back through the entrance door, it ends the entire cube dungeon run, stopping the momentum of your party when the other members may have wanted to continue on. Rumor is this is just a bug and it's been fixed, so by the time NAEU launches, who knows, this may not be the case, but it's still important to know. Another piece of content that requires a ticket to enter is Trial Paths. These are basically boss rush dungeons where you enter an instance and kill bosses as fast as possible, one after the other. Like the cube, you can get an entry ticket randomly by doing Chaos Dungeons. Trial Paths is the primary way to pick up skill gems, which grant your skills certain passive bonuses like reduced cooldown time or increased damage, making them an important endgame activity that you should do when given the chance. You can enter these solo, but as with all boss-related activities, it's better to bring friends along to split the aggro. If you're looking for a solo endgame challenge, check out the towers. Each floor of the tower presents a different challenge, and as such, puts all your various skills to the test, including burst DPS, boss damage, avoidance, and problem solving. Each floor of the tower rewards a special item ranging from silver and honing materials to valuable skill potions that increase your skill points across all characters on the server. As a player, you can enter the Tower of Shadow once your character reaches item level 302, which makes it one of the most accessible chunks of endgame content, but don't expect to complete all the floors at that item level. Things get progressively harder the more floors you complete. When you run out of daily and weekly things to do, the next thing on your list to complete are collectibles. This may not be everyone's cup of tea, but it's a huge aspect of Lost Ark. Each collectible system is slightly different, but they all ultimately end the same way, with you cashing in your rewards at a specific NPC for some valuable loot. Island tokens are gained by completing various tasks on the numerous islands in the seas of Arcasia. Some islands are open and active at specific times, Others are open 24-7 and offer different quest lines that tie into the other collectibles. 
You can monitor the activity of the islands using the special rolling calendar unlocked once you reach level 50. Most players will tell you that when you get stuck during progression, you go around and do island content, as it's a great way to gain upgrade materials that will help you ultimately progress your gear score. Giant Hearts are another collectible game through various means. Hearts can be collected via specific quests or as rapport rewards, and in some cases as rewards for completing various floors of the tower. These should be collected over time, as there are three skill point potions up for grabs, one for turning in six hearts, another for ten hearts, and finally, twelve hearts. Makoko seeds can be found all over the world. They're often hidden behind false doors or in secret areas of the map. Other times, they're just sitting there on the ground obscured by some grass. Tracking down these Makoko seeds takes a long time, but luckily the rewards are worth it. There are a number of different items up for grabs that you can get from the NPC once you turn in your seeds, including skill point potions, new crew members for your ship, and masterpieces. Another collectible we'll talk about in just a second. A collectible rooted in the life skill system, world tree leaves are collected by simply doing your life skills. If you're focused on crafting or helping your guild advance quickly by completing weekly quests, it's a nice bonus for just helping out. World Tree Leaves can be turned into a specific vendor in every major city, and the rewards often come back to enhance your life skills in some way, shape, or form. One of the more expansive collectibles in the game, masterpieces are about as tedious to track down as it gets. Some are acquired by completing aspects of your adventure tome. This is no doubt a system that you're familiar with. Every time you enter a region, you have the opportunity to fill out your adventure tome. By visiting vistas, killing certain elite NPCs, and collecting special items, you can progress your adventure tome in that region and gain certain rewards. Other masterpieces are rewarded by beating certain floors of the tower. All in all, there are 60 masterpieces to collect that reward you with a number of valuable items, like legendary cards, skill runes which enhance your character's abilities, and treasure chests that award the player with gold. Ignea tokens go hand in hand with the adventure tome. When you complete 100% of the tasks outlined in the tome for a region, you're awarded one Igneous token. Turning in tokens nets you some pretty cool rewards like a greater skill point potion, a Bifrost key which unlocks a new Bifrost slot, and an awesome golden terpy on mount. Our final collectible are Sea Bounties. These are gained a number of different ways, like completing various portions of your adventure tome, reaching a certain rapport with various NPCs, and by exchanging large sums of tokens with other NPCs, amongst other things. There are a number of crewmates you can collect as rewards for turning in sea bounties, as well as adventurers' treasure chests, which reward you with silver. As you guys can see, there is no shortage of collectibles to obtain. And while it's not directly considered progression endgame content, I think many veterans would argue it's a necessary step in your progression experience. Luckily, most of these systems are shared across your character on a given server, so you only have to do them once. Things like skill point potions, once unlocked, are available to all characters on that server. A great move in my opinion. It just further shows that the Smilegate team respects our time as players within their game. If you get bored of dungeons, raids, and collectibles, there's even more you can do. Once you reach level 50, you'll have access to that rolling calendar we talked about before, and there are a number of activities you can check out. Chaos Gates are portals that are active four times a week. On the days that they're active, they open up every hour. Each has a certain player limit, so get there as soon as possible for your chance to jump in and score some loot. The goal is simple, to find the portal commander and kill them as fast as possible. By completing a Chaos Gate, you get a treasure map based on the continent where you entered that Chaos Gate. Each map leads to an instance treasure dungeon that can be entered by four players, quadrupling the reward. While you can enter Chaos Gates as much as you'd like, you only get rewards once a day. Similar to Chaos Gates are Ghost Ships, which can be found in dangerous hazard zones in the Seas of Arcasia. Depending on where the ship is located, the item level requirement will vary. If your ship breaks due to the hazards, you will not be able to enter the Ghost Ship. If you do manage to enter, you'll be slowed and do reduced damage. While debuffed, your goal is to clear all the mobs swarming you, and inevitably, a boss. This is one of the activities you can do to get a special gear honing item that increases your chance for success, so it's definitely worth doing once a week for maximum rewards. You can do this solo, but it's recommended to do it in a party to hit your contribution requirements for maximum rewards. You've no doubt already run across a field boss during your leveling experience. These are large open world boss fights that anyone can contribute to. They often have a lot of health, thus requiring a lot of people to help take down. Once you reach level 50, you can go back and take out the field bosses in your adventure tome if you'd like, 
but it's recommended that you take on challenges that are at your item level as the rewards don't scale. These bosses reward upgrade materials, accessories, and more based on your contributions, and sometimes even drop island tokens and Omnion stars, another collectible that can be turned in for rewards. The final timed activity are Adventure Islands. These open up six times a day, three times around midday, and three times in the evening, but you can only enter once a day, twice on the weekends. Each island offers something a bit different, whether it's PvP or PvE, but you can choose which islands you want to do based on the rewards or your skills. After completing a short intro quest, you can contribute to the overall objective of the island. Depending on the island you pick, you'll get a specific reward, like silver, gold, card packs, or pirate coin chests. Each island also has a chance to drop an island-specific reward, such as an island token. The timing of these islands can get a bit confusing since there are three open at one time, so be sure to check your calendar to make sure you're not missing out. Once you unlock Lutera, you're going to gain access to your stronghold. This goes hand in hand with the life skill system you unlock at Lake Bar, and together they form an important piece of the end game. Advancing your stronghold gives you access to new crafting recipes for things like percent-based HP potions and grenades, essential items that you have to have when T2 and T3 content unlocks for the NAEU crowd. Your stronghold is also a place where you can send crews out on various automated missions. We talked about this at length in one of our recent videos, so if you're a casual player that wants to explore the endgame but doesn't have a ton of time, check it out. Think of this as passive income. You unlock a solid set of crewmates, send them out on missions, and in a few hours, you have new resources that you can use to progress your character or account. Strongholds also act as important hubs for all the things that you collect, whether it be battle items or chests. Tapping into various research aspects of your laboratory gives you as a player more flexibility to expand within the game. I do think a lot of players in the West are going to dislike the Stronghold system. I said this in a previous video, but it functions much the way a free-to-play mobile city sim does, and while there is depth to the system, it takes a second to appreciate it. A lot of this has to do with the fluff surrounding the substance, the cosmetic freedom to make your Stronghold the way you want, but there is substantial value here if you're someone looking to make the most out of the endgame. Keep in mind that the Lost Ark development team is making substantial changes to Strongholds this year, so things could look very different down the line, but until we know for certain, this is what we're working with. Although they're considered collectibles, I thought it was important to talk about cards separately from the rest of the items. Much like the other collectibles we talked about before, cards are obtained a number of different ways, as rapport rewards, from chests, as random drops, you name it. When you activate a card, it goes to your collection and can be used in a small deck. A deck is made up of six cards that, when put together in certain combinations, give you passive stat boosts. Cards come in different rarities like Uncommon, Rare, Epic, and Legendary, and as you'd expect, the rarer the card set, more times than not, the better the stat boosts. Cards aren't a game changer, but anyone that knows progression PvE knows that any sort of stat boost could be the difference between life and death, a boss being killed, and a boss killing you, and to that end, cards are worth hunting down. The final collectible I want to draw attention to are skill runes. These can be assigned one per ability that act as a sort of enhancement on that specific move it's assigned to. At the time of making this video, there are 12 runes, and collecting them all oftentimes boils down to RNG. Some skill runes are required by turning in various collectibles, while other times they're dropped from random bosses and things like guardian raids. Skill runes are one of the more valuable enhancements a player can make to their character. Some examples of their benefits are increased casting speed, cooldown reductions, and even bleed effects on your abilities. If it's not abundantly clear, there's a lot you can do once you reach the end game in Lost Ark, and hopefully this guide gave you a better understanding of what content you want to seek out. There are a ton of resources on the internet if you're someone that wants to cut corners when it comes to things like Makoko seeds and giant hearts, so do a quick Google search and figure out the best path for you. If you are someone that's interested in endgame content, I want to welcome you all to join the Legacy Gaming Guild on day one. Our Discord has skyrocketed in the last few days. We've already got 800 members ready and raring to go on day one. You can check out the link in the description to join up and learn more. If you've been following along with our Lost Ark coverage, then you already know. We've got a whole lineup of content ready to go, so be sure to like this video and subscribe if you want to support the channel and help other people find our videos. Finally, if you like everything we're doing here at Legacy Gaming and you'll want to support the channel even more, you can do so by becoming a member. For just a couple bucks, you're helping us achieve our dreams of making YouTube a full-time passion. My name is Kodiak, and from everyone here at Legacy Gaming, thanks for watching, and play on.